Hello, everybody, and welcome to another U of Care podcast. My name is Oliver Grundman, and it's my honor and privilege to talk today with Dr. Dan Wesson from the Department of Pharmacology at the University of Florida. Dan, do you mind introducing yourself? Yeah, of course. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Dan Wesson. As uh, Oliver mentioned, I'm associate professor in pharmacology and therapeutics in the College of Medicine. Um, in addition to being a CARE member, um, as well as many of you are, I'm also a member of the uh, UF Center for Smell and Taste and also the UF's uh, Norman Fixel Institute for Neurological Disorders. That is certainly an interesting uh, smell and taste, a center for smell and taste. Um, I think these are so intricate senses. Uh, can, you, can you tell us a little bit more about that and how that relates to the field of addiction? Right, yeah, so yeah, great question, I'm glad you asked. So my training, everything I've done throughout my career, actually the whole reason why I got into science was driven by a curiosity about how um, chemosensory stimuli in our environments drive behaviors. So I was really interested in, even as an undergrad um, in how experiences with odors influence your emotional responses, uh, also influence your decision making. And so I did my PhD and postdoc both in olfactory systems neuroscience, where I studied olfactory bulb activity using awake calcium imaging, and then as a postdoc doing unit recordings in the cortex to look at how odor coding changes in the cognitive uh, capacities. So how it relates to addiction to get to your question um, is that we all know that many of our cravings towards addictive substances and our relapse to addiction are triggered by environmental cues. So for instance, one might imagine the smell of a, a nice scotch or a nice rum or a cigar or cigarette smoke could easily trigger somebody to start engaging with substances that they previously tried to get away from in the first place. Um, and certainly the combination of some of these chemosensory stimuli with the addictive substances, and these examples, nicotine or alcohol, um, certainly influence our engagement with the stimulus and makes the engagement of the stimulus more frequent because there's that palatable, enjoyable cue that comes along with the nicotine or the alcohol. Ha, huh, that is uh, fascinating. Uh, so when we, uh, so you, you kind of already mentioned how you actually got interested in the field of uh, sensories and, and sensory stimuli, uh, uh, olfactory stimuli and all of that, and how that now relates to addiction as well. Um, and uh, I, I find it very interesting how we actually then respond necessarily not to ethanol itself initially or to nicotine, but how we kind of make these connections with other substances that are found in, for example, cigars, as you mentioned, or rum flavor substances uh, that are not necessarily, that, that we make these associations in our brain with that, right? Right. Yeah. And that's, you know, I think it's, um, you know, perhaps on purpose or by very fortunate chance, or in many cases, unfortunate chance that these substances occur naturally with uh, aromatic stimuli, right? Either smell or taste. And then also on top of that, in addition to smell or taste, you have the, the feeling of stimulus sensation in your mouth, which is a major guiding factor. For instance, what food you eat um, is strongly influenced by the texture, the temperature. We all know that, right? Nobody wants a, a super mushy banana. Nobody wants to eat a bag of steel chips that have been sitting out by the pool for two hours on a human day. This is very unappealing. There's a lot of, of human choices that are dictated by what's called mouthfeel. There's a lot of human ch choices then that are also dictated by smell and taste. And while they're not as appreciated as much as decisions we make based upon visual stimuli and auditory stimuli, certain those kind of subconscious stimuli that are entering in along with the substances that will potentiate addiction um, are our major uh, culprits in our society's desire to smoke, drink, and abuse other substances. So uh, how does all of that influence and lead into your current work, your current research that you're doing? Yeah, great question. So 
I start off, I, I'm not by, I'm not a card carrying addiction scientist. I'm not somebody who has been in this from the beginning to study, let's say, cocaine addiction, the circuitry underlying alcohol reinforcement. This isn't the, the scientist that I am. I started off understanding, as I kind of alluded to in the beginning, how stimuli drive emotional responses and behavioral responses and the decision to act upon things. So it turns out that um, a very underappreciated part of the brain um, in your olfactory system um, is the focus of my lab. So this part of the brain is called the olfactory tubercle. Actually, just uh, recently in the middle of um, this month, September, um, we had a paper published in the Journal of Neuroscience where we actually renamed the structure from olfactory tubercle to the tubular striatum to help the field reconceptualize the role of this brain structure as a striatal circuit that might be very important for evaluating stimuli and acting upon them. So my lab is the, um, the, the leading lab, I think it's safe to say in the world, um, thanks to all of my uh, very hardworking uh, students and postdocs um, in understanding the neurobiology of the tubular striatum. So a lot of our work early on was looking at how neurons in the tubular striatum represent sensory information based upon learning and motivation. So we would shape rats or mice to engage in operant odor guided task while we record it from neurons in their brain using dense electrode arrays or calcium imaging, local field potentials, et cetera. Along the way of doing those studies, we published some important fundamental insights into how those neurons engage sensory information and represent that sensory information in faithful manners. We also very excitingly realized that we were seeing this structure that we at the time thought of as a purely olfactory structure with, with goggles on, kind of like the, the horse goggles that keep the horses you know, looking forward and not you know, getting confused and turning around. We are scrolling through traces of activity of tubular striatum neurons. And you could see very clearly that the neurons were more strongly firing action potentials for the reward that we are conditioning this, the odor to represent and be uh, associated with, then they were even representing the odor in the first place. So here, the structure that we thought was olfactory is really dramatically telling the brain reward, right? And that made us kind of pivot a little bit in our conceptualization of what the tubular striatum neurons are doing, right? It made us think, um, perhaps just because somebody in the mid 19th century named the structure olfactory and just because it's close to the olfactory bulb right between your eyes which relays the bulk of information out to the cortex and other structures that it's not so simple to think of this as purely an olfactory structure so we designed a variety of behavioral paradigms and manipulations to test that um, and former postdocs marie gadziola luke stetzik and current post postdocs in my lab, um, Catherine Wright, uh, Sangun Ru, and uh, graduate student Natalie Johnson, and a research assistant professor who's a member of CARE as well, uh, Mandy Dosett, are all working on projects to define the way that tubular stratum neurons are not just representing information based upon their predictive meaning, their value, but also how these neurons are engaged during cocaine self-administration, Q-induced relapse to seek cocaine, and also to test uh, causal roles of these neurons in those behaviors. Um, and one project that's very specific to the kind of the chemosensory stuff that we were talking to earlier is a project we have that's collaboration with a group at UPenn, Marla De Biasi and Ming Kong Ma. And this is on how the smell, the chemosensory component of e-cigarettes drives nicotine reinforcement, and specifically in adolescents, which we know are very prone to experimenting with these fruit flavorings and all these are things they can buy from local stores or get from their friends that are marketed towards children. They have pictures of animated characters on them. They have pictures of really palatable grapes and cherries. So the, the lab went from, in, in short, um, I could talk forever about this, the lab went from fundamental neurobiology of sensory processing to um, a morphed view of that, where we're looking at fundamental neurobiology of sensory processing, but with a magnifying glass towards the brain substrates that are driving reinforcement and addiction. Um, and that all happened over the course of just about four years. It's been a pretty exciting time. Wow. Yeah. If you, if, I mean, uh, just, you know, hearing you conceptualize or just branching out from, uh, 
a, a sense that uh, evolutionary speaking has been with us obviously for millions of years, right? It has evolved over a very long time and that we may not relay as strongly on as some of our ancestors did and many other mammals are doing, but still it, it impacts us. I mean, you, you, you talk, you primarily focus on olfactory, but you also mentioned other smells like taste um, that play an important role in how we, uh, what, what kind of associations we form with food or other items around us. Uh, so when, when we have this re reward or reinforcement, um, uh, processing. So, when you when you say the the olfactory striatum and and potentially connections to other brain regions, has that been explored before to that extent that there are potentially other, you know, uh, extensions or connections to uh, the uh, prefrontal cortex or to to other areas in the in the midbrain or to even the brain stem? Has that been to to that extent? Uh, investigated before? In the context of the tubular striatum? Yes. Uh, you know, it's hard to say something's never been done because uh, oftentimes you'll find a paper from 1960s done by a uh, not too widely cited group in Russia or some other country where someone has made a very important advance, but it just hasn't gotten recognized by mainstream scientists, especially in America. I think a lot of folks are guilty of this, um, including Shirley and myself. I try not to be. There's a few papers that have been done on connectivity between the tubular striatum, what used to be called the olfactory tubercle, and forebrain structures, including the frontal cortex. Um, and actually, one of the postdocs I haven't mentioned here, because her work isn't really driven by understanding the neurobiology of addiction and motivation, is uh, Hillary Cancer. She has a postdoctoral NRSA from the NIH to study frontal cortex modulation of the tubercle striatum in the context of attention, right? So basically understanding the, the circuitry which allows you when you're in a restaurant and it's loud and you're talking to someone just like we're doing now, but imagine we have a nice plate of food brought in front of us. What allows you to selectively attend to that inhalation of that aroma from your food while there's all this other stuff going on. Restaurants are really loud, there's visual cues, there's people walking by left and right, the waiter's coming to ask you how it tastes, which is so obnoxious in the first minute you get your food. Um, and, but what allows you to pay attention to what comes in your nose? So that's frontal cortex, modulation to real striatum. I think Hillary's gonna have a lot of exciting work in that area. And we also have an interesting project, which is spearheaded by uh, Sangun Ru, a uh, postdoc in the lab on basal lateral amygdala modulation of activity in the tubular striatum. And I think uh, Catherine Wright is excited to kind of extend that into her studies of tubular striatum cocaine relapse. Um, so there's a lot of work to, so before the work in my lab, which just started nine years ago, um, no one had done in vivo recordings from tubular striatum neurons. No one knew in an awake animal experiencing its environment how the neurons and the tubular striatum it represented that information. And so we've had to work from the ground up. For instance, if we were in the hippocampus, thousands of papers have done that. And we could dive right in with some mechanistic insight and some circuit that influences the hippocampus to then generate the memory of where someone experienced a drug, for instance. We've worked from the bottom up. And with all the people in the lab, now we're at the part where we know kind of the fundamental workings of what happens in the tubercle to some extent. Still a lot of voids, of course, it's not a closed book. Um, and now we're at the point to link those inner workings with connectivity of other brain structures. What, what leaves the tubercle, what comes into the tubercle. We've had a few papers on this, but it's just starting. Yeah. Uh, I, I cannot imagine how exciting this must be because, I mean, you, you're looking at, at the part of addiction, you're looking at other parts, how uh, it, 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 the interconnectivity of the neural networks out of that area, into that area, the input, output. Um, uh, but also, you know, we, we hear about pathophysiologies, how they might be influenced by memory formation, uh, uh, so how is that being processed potentially through 
uh, this this area of the brain. Uh, we, we, Alzheimer's, this peanut butter, you know, uh, smell, for example, that has also been the test has been developed at, at UF, I believe, or it has been, I'm not sure if it was developed, but at least it was kind of, I heard news a few years ago about that. Uh, so I, I think there's lots of things that uh, that uh, have a potential for for your group in particular to uh, to to just generate a ton of research, a ton of new findings. So where do you particularly see your research uh, going in the next three years, next five years? You know, where do you where do you see that going? Where, what are you most excited about? Yeah, yeah, that's right. But I think, uh, um, especially in this era, right, right, right now during this interview, we're six months into the COVID pandemic, which we were hoping would have ended four months ago. And I think it's so important for all of us um, to, to continue seeing the, the trajectory and the growth in our science and our labs. And I think this is really important for our, um, our lab members, our trainees, and our, our other colleagues. The, the overwhelming anxiety so many people feel on what happens tomorrow, what happens next week um, can be debilitating. And I think having a long-term goal about where your science is going in three years is exactly the solution to this day-to-day -day anxiety driven by all the societal stuff that's going on right now. Um, where we would be in three to five years, first off, out of the COVID pandemic, <laughs> I think, yes, let's, let's, Fingers crossed. Um, and I think by that time, we will have established, um, the lab as a whole will have established the first data showing the, the critical roles of tubular stratum neurons in the context of addiction to, um, to addictive substances, including hopefully cocaine, possibly in our e-cigarette project as well. We're also building all of those addiction science projects. Very importantly, um, this is really important to stress, all those projects are being built on a foundation of fundamental neurobiology and motivated behaviors. So I don't think we're gonna be able to resolve, um, again, this is the perspective of a non-card-carrying addiction scientist. I don't think we're gonna be able to resolve uh, the neurobiology of a debilitating disease like addiction by just driving in and trying to do pharmacotherapies, driving in 100% only understanding psychological interventions, behavioral modification, et cetera. We need to understand the brain systems that support motivated behavior, even in a healthy brain. This is very important to then be able to look at how things are changed in the pathophysiological states that you mentioned. Um, and so in the next three to five years, I think the lab will also be contributing a lot of important data on the, the systems and circuits in the brain that drive um, motivated behavior in non-pathological but healthy states as well. For instance, motivation just to obtain water, motivation just to interact with uh, another animal, right? Social interaction, motivation to try to obtain food. Um, these can all be leveraged to make insights into the, the perturbed states that happen in addiction models, at least in the, the rotor models we work in. Well, I'm, I'm really excited to, to see what's, what's coming out of your research group. And uh, certainly, it, I, I just listening, I'm, I'm motivated to jump right in <laughs> and be part of it. <laughs> but, <laughs> you can come anytime and do experiments. Uh, will you work for free? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you know, you know how we researchers are, you know, publish or perish. So if I can publish, <laughs> that's fine that's for right. me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, that's right. <laughs> so, um, uh, to end on a, I, I think you, you're definitely right, uh, COVID obviously has thrown us all into kind of a, a weird space and that kind of where are we in a, in a year where are we even in just a few weeks, you know, uh, depending on w where we were three months ago or where we now, uh, so um, I'm, I'm right there with you as everybody else is. Um, uh, what do you think is the biggest challenge moving forward uh, uh, in regards to uh, public policies, in regards to 
uh, overall addiction research. Um, now you, you kind of had a cross paths where you have a lot of intersectionality, not only with addiction research, but also with many other uh, fields when it comes to exploring this neural network and all of its connections that it has. But when you focus on, on that part of addiction research and substance use disorders, what do you think are the, the most important obstacles that need to be addressed in, in the near future? Right. Um, I think on the bigger picture level, um, I think society needs to stop stigmatizing people who are afflicted with addiction disorders. I think the, that's something that me as, a, as a, a wet lab, so to speak, fundamental scientist, even I recognize this is really important. I can't imagine the, the numerous care members here at UF who feel 100% the same. Um, this is a problem because that influences not just how we provide um, humanistically to other people in our society, um, our family members, our friends, but also the, just the people walking and crossing the street. But this also um, impacts dramatically uh, the government's view of supporting research into understanding and treating um, addicted persons. Um, and providing support to those people that might not be a treatment, but might just be a societal, for instance, um, you know, funding after school programs to try to reduce the um, availability, just the free time after school of children to experiment with drugs, funding things to educate people on the powers that, um, that happen. For instance, when you heat up an e-cigarette device and you think it's cool because it smells like strawberry and it's a neat electronic device, right? Just like your phone that you get to play with and program, and you get to be with your friends experimenting with this, but you don't realize the, the very powerful toxic chemicals that now you're inhaling upon heating that otherwise fruity substance. There's a lot of changes that I think can happen in society when we stop saying that just because someone got hooked on a drug or used to be hooked on a drug that, that they're weak or that they're, for some reason they were raised in a bad environment or for some reason they're more likely to be a criminal or rob you. Um, that's a major issue that I think even for someone like me, who again is a fundamental scientist in a lab, um, quite actually, honestly, uh, remote and distant from the, the, the human uh, uh, victims of addiction um, by not interacting with them in a research clinical setting. That's something that even I and my research would benefit tremendously from. And that, so I think that's a big challenge, I would say. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think that uh, there's something that uh, youth care members, at least the ones that I've interviewed so far, uh, have have repeatedly uh, voiced as well. So I think that is something that we need to be aware of as a society. And well, we'll, we'll see where <laughs> where where we stand in in a few years on that. Um, so. Okay, so um, then thank you very much for taking the time today. I think this is really exciting research uh, and I, I can't wait to to see what's coming next uh, for you and for all of your lab members for your whole research group mm -hmm. um, so uh, I'm going to stay tuned and I hope that our audience is going to stay tuned as well uh, thanks again for taking the time today and to our audience watch out for the next U of Care podcast thank you so much for listening thanks Oliver